And welcome back to another episode of the Woods Water Mizzou podcast. I'm our one of your regular co-host Skeeter. Along with me tonight, as usual, is Case and most frequent guest, <laughs> Cole. <laughs> What's Fellas, up, y'all? How y'all doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good. All right. Before we get too heavy into it, let's go ahead and talk about our presenting sponsor. Thanks to our presenting sponsor, Murphy Kinney Sumi Trial Lawyers, the trusted personal injury lawyers of the Woods Water Mizzou podcast. MKS is the name to think of when legal representation is needed for a personal injury anywhere in the state of Missouri. Call them at 816-281-5470 or visit murphykinneysumi.com today. Murphy Kinney Sumi. Authentic. Driven. Results. Appreciate MKS uh, being the presenting sponsor. So, fellas, week one of camp uh fall camp is in the book uh and we we got a little bit of answers and drink what's presser this week on on some things uh mainly offensive line uh but i'll go ahead and start with some of the questions and just kind of the order i wrote them down uh that he answered so uh philip roche the young defensive back that made some plays for us last year he got in some trouble uh, last week and, and apparently has a need for speed but did not show up to any court dates on speeding tickets so therefore had a warrant put out I believe was arrested, posted bond and back practicing with the team Drinkwit said that he did not meet the standard of what it means to be a Missouri Tiger but they are handling the, the punishment internally, there will be no suspension uh, on something like that, I'm okay with like nip it in the bud now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you continue how the problems out of him, then yes, you probably want to see a little bit stricter punishment policy. But uh, I thought that was worth mentioning. Uh, go ahead, Case. No, yeah, I, I think that's it's 2024, and I, I used kind of what you said there. I think we live in a world of college football era where you can't just kick kids off teams, you know just for yeah. stuff like that. Because I feel like there was a little bit of kickback from I saw that, and they were like, they wanted more out of them. But, I mean, man, Georgia's got guys going wild down there. You know, the Chiefs had their best wide receiver street race in Dallas and wreck a car. Like, I think, I think this is just part of young men having fast cars nowadays. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think a little bit <clears> – <throat> excuse me, I think a little bit of it kind of – I don't want to say as expected given, you know, the the NIL era and, and things of that nature, but um, there, there's one thing to be speeding, but to have it happen multiple times and then miss, you know, court dates and court appearances yeah. and all of a sudden you have a warrant out and that, that yeah. it's a slippery, slippery slope. So being able to, you know, nip it in the bud and kind of get it taken care of, that's, it kind of seems like that's what Drink's doing. Yeah. The, the failure to appear, like, court system is just gonna gonna forget him but if mr roche is listening he can call our friends over at mks and they can help with that legal representation they could have gone uh, there pretty for him <laughs> that's it uh overall drinkwitz said it was a lot of sloppy football uh week one like you kind of expect that you know new guys long off season and you know, just kind of everybody finding their footing again. He said overall it was a great attitude from all the players. Everybody was very coachable uh, and still a lot of open competition. And I love the fact of certain positions that we have open competition in. Uh, you know, the offensive line, uh, a lot of the defense is, is open competition. I like that this year we don't have the open competition at quarterback, you know, uh, he even went as far to say that uh, Pine is clearly the number two quarterback. Uh, and so to know that that position secured feels great. But you like the fact that there's there's a lot of competition. you got guys 
they're going like game reps at practice. I'd assume if you're in a position battle because you want to put on on that practice film. You want to show the coaches that you're the guy that needs to be out there on Saturdays. So, uh, anything on that you'll want to talk about? Man, uh, sloppy football, I guess, is like that's one thing we got to be ready for. I think we're going to see sloppy football against Murray State. I think I think it's hard to get a whole team rowing in the same direction until week three. And I say that because I was thinking about today when I drive home from work, I was thinking about the first two games last year. You no, know, we talked about this stuff tonight and just how down I was after we did not beat Middle Tennessee convincingly whatsoever. And uh, maybe it was drink holding stuff back. Maybe it's just it takes a long time to get that many dudes on the same page and row in the right direction. That's why um, That's why a lot of teams, you know, try and schedule those big games week one because you might catch a better team sleeping, a team you would not beat in week six, you know? Yeah. So I, I know drink said sloppy. I, I, I agree it's probably it's pretty sloppy, but we're probably going to see sloppy football on August 29th too. I would, yeah, I would agree with you. I think it's expected <clears throat> at the uh, the first full week of fall camp. You know, yeah, the guys have been together over the summer, conditioning and position drills and things like that. But as far as organized scrimmage football, that's expected week one. Um, I mean, I think when you come back from a lengthy vacation and go back to doing your job, you're you're a little rusty um, after you know being out of it for a while. So these guys, uh, coaches and players alike, I think are going to take a little bit of meshing and, and kind of get some camaraderie and chemistry. And yeah, I'm with you. I mean, heck it was 23. Uh, I think I posted an Instagram reel of the, uh, the monsters Inc audio 23, 19 was that final score against uh, middle Tennessee state. So yeah, nothing to panic about. Obviously, the first week of fall camp. I will say the thing that surprised me, I think you guys even touched on it a little bit last week without me, was the amount of open positions, I guess, uh, for position battles on that offensive line. The fact that there were – so it really sounds like there's only two, maybe three, that are solidified right now? Well, we got answers. Uh, You teed that up really, really good without knowing. So uh, that was the next note on here. I believe four of them are secure. Uh, Caden Green appears is going to be left guard. He's more comfortable at guard. That's what Drinkwood said. Uh, you know, Case, you said last week you, you had heard that Green wanted to play tackle. But now Drinkwood's saying that, that Green's more comfortable in this blocking scheme and running scheme, playing on the inside. Uh, and a big body at guard like that, I think that that benefits us. But. And this is a pulling offensive line. So a guy like him who can play tackle, be agile enough to get out and pull those lead blocks does fit us well. Absolutely. And then uh, Connor Tomlinson is going to be our, our center again, I think. Surprise. We, we got that answer. Um, and then, so that, that leaves left tackle. And a lot of people have Marcus Bryant penciled in. And, I think that's a kind of safe bet if, if I had to put my money on it, the big uh, transfer from SMU. But uh, Richardson is also – him and him and Brian are swapping out first-team reps at left tackle. So uh, that's really about the only spot, spot left there. And uh, you just hope, you know, the, these younger guys that – we're competing for that left guard spot or, or center, you know, uh, like Logan Reichert comes to the top of my mind. Like, yeah, you, you hope he still just loves Mizzou football and, and is working to get better every day at practice. And next year he, he slots in there wherever needed, uh, you know, but it, it's exciting to know who those guys are, but then at the same time you think about the other guys that are there and, and, with the way the transfer portal and everything is, I know that won't open till after the season, but you just hope they stay focused because offensive linemen, they get rolled up on, they yeah. get injuries. And you need these guys to stay focused and stay working on their craft. So if they get called on, they're ready to go. Yeah. Logan Riker is one I am concerned about because I think him and uh, green were like one and three, like top alignment in the state. Right. They were both 
really highly touted. Um, I honestly thought Logan would be at least in starting contention by now. Although I had heard people like Gabe Matter say it's like two years away, so that'd be next season for him, developmental wise. Um, which is fine, you know. I, we'll have spots open up next year as well. But um, yeah, you definitely want to see guys like that, prospects like that, stick around. In case you used to play off the line, so uh, oh, I thought you were getting ready to talk there, but just <laughs> you were quiet for a little bit. So I went and cut in there, but uh, don't. Like the five starters, they don't necessarily – well, I know like center, they don't play special teams. You have your, your special team snapper. but uh, So like Logan Riker, he'll, he'll get to go out on special teams and field goal units and, and yeah. punting units and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's how I got my, my first like varsity time in high school was on a field goal unit. So, yeah, it's a good way to work guys in, get field time. Okay. Uh, Cole, did you have anything else you wanted to say as far as offensive line on, on that news? Yeah, just touch on the depth part. I mean, if there's a position that you want in the SEC to have comfortable depth and healthy competition, that's that's your trenches, right? I mean, defense is a little more, I guess, subject to um, more regular rotation as far as substitution goes. But as far as offensive line, man, you know, you, you got your true five. And then you got guys that, you know, yeah, you could either plug and play in a jumbo package or Guys are like, man, you know, this one's just a little bit better. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really, really comfortable at backup. So, yeah, guys like Logan Reichert, uh, Drake Heismeyer, you know, guys that, um, I mean, even Taylor Chandler, I know he's a freshman, but, you know, he was a he was a big flip for drink coming from Colorado to, uh, to Mizzou. So it's, it's a good problem to have, I guess, that you're having, you know, healthy competition, like I said, at the, uh, at the O-line position. Absolutely. And, and I would think whoever doesn't get that left tackle spot between Richardson and Bryant will fill in the role of uh, Marcellus Johnson last year when we would run that sixth offensive lineman out there. And, you know, that's that's something Drinkwitz and Kirby Moore utilized a lot last year in the run and, and passing game as well. So uh, they're still going to get to see the field a lot, even if they're not one of the starting five. That's kind of some of my thought on that too. It, uh, you know, as far as the bringing in the additional alignment, I mean, with a as of now a, a dual-headed monster running back, um, it's uh, with the endless depth that we have at wide receiver. I mean, guys like Kirby Moore's got to be just elated that he has the depth at just about every single position that you would want on the offense in order to just create these insane packages. I mean, can you imagine bringing in a, a jumbo set with an additional offensive lineman or two, and then a guy like a good blocking tight end like Brett Norfleet on the end and just, I mean, pounding the ball, running the crap out of the ball. Um, you know, when it when it comes to it, that's, I guess, what I'm getting at. I'm rambling a little bit, but it's good to have those options. Like, if you need to throw some uh, throw some weight on the offensive line, just grind the clock down. It appears as of now on the uh, on the roster, we got it. It's almost like he's the the card dealer at a casino. He, you know, he it's not too often you go in there and beat the house, so he he, he knows what he's got there and is able to play a good hand. Uh, you, you talk about the running game, man. I, I think you've got like a hidden camera somewhere in my house, and you see my notes or. Uh, my wife's texting you to him because you are just like going right in order here. Uh, three running backs he mentioned. Mentioned uh, biggest thing he said he was going to determine running back position was protecting the quarterback. And the three that he mentioned was Carroll, Noel, and Roberts. Uh, and then he even went on later and said that they put Tavares Jones in on first team in practice the other day. And he was lighting them up. So uh, he said that competition is still wide open. And if you think back last year, you know, at the end of the year, we knew Cody was RB1. But at the beginning of the year, you know, he, he got majority of the carries. But you're still seeing a lot of Nathaniel Pete out there. Uh, Pete in and out. Won the Middle Tennessee game with that uh, wheel route he ran to get wide open yeah. and score the winning touchdown. So, yeah. hey, I'll be honest, going into the K State game, I thought he was RB1. Yeah. 
you know, I I thought he'd had a better game, and really, Schrader didn't take off until second half of the Memphis game. Yeah, I was gonna say Memphis game is kind of where I remember he, him because he kind of came in and played closer in the second half. And for the first half, it was big bombs to Speedy and stuff like that. It was either we throw a dynamite strike for a touchdown or we go three and out. Yeah, we look we look like the old Rams in that in their old stadium. Um, so yeah, it's heck. I mean, this this job may not be settled by Murray State or Boston College, even you know. And it's a position that. I'm not stressed about. I, I believe in the the scheme. I believe in Drinkwitz and Coach Looper's eye of talent at, at that position. Uh, you know, a lot of people outside of Mizzou are like, "How's Mizzou going to replace Cody Schrader?" Well, nobody was worried about Tyler Beatty in 2021, uh, yeah. leading the SEC in rushing, and he comes out of nowhere and does it. You know, we were worried like, "Who's going to replace Larry Roundtree?" And Beatty comes in and, and just lights it on fire. And then uh, the year after Beatty, Schrader and Pete were the main two, again, splitting there. N- neither one really established themselves, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, Pete, if he didn't have that fumble in Auburn, I think he would have would have seized the job then. But, uh, yeah, you know, and then, and then last year, Cody kind of started off so, like you said, but then it's just like, the more the season went on and the longer games went on, you know, he got the nickname the Shredder, and that's yeah. that's when he would, would put his work in. So uh, if there's a position, I'm not worried about who's starting. Running back and wide receiver would probably be the two I'm most comfortable in. No, I agree. And, and you said this, but it was an earlier, but you need, you need to rotate running backs in and out. That's a position that is just so much wear and tear on a player. That uh, it's hard. You leave one guy in there, and you're liable for a big injury. So, I mean, I I think it's I think it's smart. If you got three guys that can start, you think? I think it's smart to rotate those three guys throughout a game. Hurts one guy's overall yardage, you know, for stats and stuff. But I think you get a little bit of earth wind fire there with something else. Uh, lightning and thunder, I think, is the moniker that they've given Carol and Noel That's there. Cool. So uh, I, I like that. As far as defensive tackle, it sounds like your starters are going to be Christian uh, Williams and Chris McClellan, which you know we like to rotate yeah. four. We had four solid defensive tackles last year. Uh, and so we bring in New Mexico State transfer Sterling Webb. Uh, he's gonna He's got that third spot locked down. And then the fourth one is a battle between uh, Graciol and Jalen Marshall. And man, it Graciol was a kid coming out of high school. I was like, oh, this kid's going to be huge. And I know it's been a very upperclassman laden uh, depth position for us on defensive tackle. But I was kind of wanting to see him get more game action than what he has. And to hear that he's going into year three now and still battling for that rotational spot. I was, I was kind of disappointed to hear that because I, I wanted to hear that he was going to be one of the main guys, and he very well can still win it in camp. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that was one of them St. Louis area kids excited to, to hear a Missouri kid coming in, and he, he was a big recruit for us at the time. You know, now we're recruiting them, them type guys. You know, they're all time dime a dozen on the roster but you're right and i think why we think of his name so much because i was he was hot in my ear as well uh is because when we brought him in our d-line was the worst in the country you remember that like that that started that was the year of his class so i remember saying he might have been bigger than luther because how bad our d-line was little did i know it wasn't the players were bad it was just the scheme from wilkes was uh just not a college scheme that all didn't work for us um but i mean I'm gonna can I, can I say like the flip side of that? Judd Marshall, Kansas City kid, uh, in year two fighting production spot, I think it's huge. He's a he's a sophomore. Uh, he has put on a bunch of size. I think he went into Mizzou at 280. He's 315 now. Um, because like he was a big kid when he played uh, here in KC, but he was like I want to say lanky, but not not D line Bessie C big. You know, uh, he's put that weight on and. I'm, man, I'm very excited for Marshall. He is someone 
because I always follow local kids a little bit, you know, yeah. it's kind of part of the fun. But, um, man, I, I'm excited for Julian Marshall. I think he's going to do big things here. He comes from St. Thomas Aquinas. That's got a uh, big pedigree out there. So I think I'm excited for him. Yeah, man. Gracias. That's, that's one I'm with you. I'm with you both. I'm really, really pulling for that kid. I really want to see him break through that ceiling. I really want to see him get in the rotation, but holy smokes, when you got guys like Christian Williams coming back, who had a phenomenal year last year, is set up to do great things this year. And then you bring in a guy like Chris McClellan, who came from Florida, who had a pretty darn good season. And not only that, I said it a couple weeks ago, whatever the last uh, episode I was on, that he is a behemoth of a human. I mean, that guy is huge. He can fill some major space in the middle. So it kind of makes me wonder, you know, has has Graciel thought about going the, you know, D Rob route and and kicking to the outside, or it makes you think, okay, maybe that's why guys like DJ Westlack, you know, hit the portal. Um, you know, because they're looking at this room and they're like, how obviously it's important for them to play because that's that's why they do what they do. But you really got to tip your hats to to some of these kids, like you said, Graciel going into year three that hadn't seen the, the field a whole lot, probably could go see the field at another program. But he decided to stick around and, and battle it out. And that's the kind of kid that I want battling for a spot on, on my defensive line. That is, that's huge to me. Um, not only in, in judge of character, but for, for depth, it's, that's massive. I just, I just realized here on video, I looked up, saw myself and, Looks like my shirt says Saints football, and I, I don't, I don't like that. This is about right. This that is, is a Saints. That this is, is a Saints say football. Your team, okay, Saints football. Just for anybody watching, that is, um, um, yeah, a common <laughs> slur for the Saints. Cole, the New, or- the New Orleans Spencer Rattlers. You, you talked about <laughs> Chris McClellan, and that was the next note I had. Uh, I saw an interview with him, and Gabe Diarman asked him. You know, how close was he to pick a Mizzou two to three years ago when he was coming out of high school, I believe out of Oklahoma, uh, ended up going to Florida. And he said it was really close. There's just a few things he wanted wanted different. And I think winning had a big thing to do with that. He didn't come out and say it outright. But a quote that he said really stuck out to me. He was talking about drink wits. And he said everything he told me he was going to do, he has done step by step. So Drinkwitz had a plan he was laying out to recruits two to three years ago that's coming to fruition. Uh, and you hear him talk about going to SEC championships and winning, you know, competing to win for them and, and getting the playoffs. Like, man, that just made me love Drinkwitz just a little bit more, you know, uh, hearing a player say that about a coach and then, uh, I know he, he's going to say good things now because he's a Mizzou Tiger, but uh, for for him to remember details from back then as re- in the recruiting process and, and see it in action now, uh, I hope it makes you all feel as good as it, it made me. Oh, absolutely, it does, man. Because like that's that's your biggest that's your big fear, right? Is you know you sell all these kids all these promises and then they, they're like, this is all bucket of lies and. Uh, Man, that's that's kind of nice. It is nice hearing someone be like, "No, he, everything he says he's gonna do, he's done, laid out right there." Yeah. So things are on track. That's what you want to hear. You love it when a plan comes together. Man. I'll put it that way. I kind of think of it the same way as like if I'm laying in bed night before a big, you know, cold front rolls in or something like that. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go to this stand, and the deer's gonna come in from this way, and he's gonna do this and make this kind of shot. It's just it. Like I said, you love it when a plan comes together. Absolutely. As far as defense, that, that's all the notes, so I'm just going off of memory here. He, he did nothing but heap praise on defensive line and depth, defensive end, there's six guys he's talking about, you know. Uh, and then defensive tackle, you, you got those five guys competing for four rotational spots. Uh, I think the biggest question mark on defense to me, I know a lot of people are going to say outside corner, uh, because you're you're having to replace Enos Rex Straw and Chris Abrams Strain. But we have Marcus Clark, we have Norwood, we brought Torino Pride Jr. in. So 
I'm not as worried about corner. To me, I want to hear more out of the linebacker room. Is it is it Hicks and Newsom? Is it their show? Or you, I know, think you so. bring in you bring in flag. Uh I know Zadarius Smith was a listed as a linebacker for Georgia, but I think he's going to be primarily a defensive end for us. Uh, but, you, you know, you get the South Alabama transfer. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was he was a big-time transfer win for us. So what are we, we going to see out of that linebacker room? Are they going to be rotating? or They would have to be, right? That's too many dudes. That's, that's a lot of talent there. It is funny, though, because the overall their fan base is when we got the South Alabama linebacker. I can't remember his name, and I feel terrible about it right now. Was that I was going to go to Mizzou because you know they don't have anyone to play linebacker. Yeah, you know, and I was like, guys, not like that. I was like, I don't know where he's going to fit in. Yeah, you know, like I don't know if we have we want to play two linebackers. Bring a kid out of Michigan too. That was yes, a, a high recruit. That's kind of a freshman though, so he's he needs to develop. But uh, you're right, you're right. They put a lot of people into the linebacker room, and I'm not saying it's bad, but we are a team that really runs an extra safety instead of a third linebacker. So, um, yeah. Khalil Jacobs, by the way, has a name. Khalil Thank Jacobs. You so yes. Thank you, Cole. Okay. So, and you guys bring up an interesting point about that, about the whole plethora of talent. I feel like that's kind of the, the theme of this episode that we're talking about here. It makes you wonder because they brought in a bunch of guys. We, we lost a bunch of guys to the draft or, you know, just ended their eligibility on the D-line both inside and outside, returned some talent, um, but lost quite a bit of, of production, I'll say. Then you look at the linebackers. You know, you have Hopper that goes to Green Bay, but you bring back Hicks and you bring back Newsom that, you know, had a little bit of experience there. Lose quite a bit of the DBs, but you bring in guys like Toriano Pride, um, the other flag brother. Gosh, we're, we're just really <laughs> – we're really setting it off here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. But um, – but it makes you wonder that, okay, Corey Batoon comes in. He looks at what we lost, what we did last year, what we were good at, what we return, and what they excelled at. And then you bring in all this excess talent. So it's like, okay, are we compensating for the loss? Or is Batoon going to run a aggressive style defense that he wants to be able to get fresh legs and fresh talent in there in order to keep a good, solid product on the field? Yeah, but we saw last year how important that linebacker depth was. You know, we ended up losing both starters. Uh, didn't have either either one of them for majority of second half of the season. And you know, Ohio State for all they want to say, you know, backup quarterback or third string, like guys, we were down uh, two NFL draft picks on our defense. You know, both starting linebackers. So. You know, cry more, but those guys can play. But it's like, what? What do we? <laughs> how, how are these guys going to see the field? I don't think we are used as Mizzou fans this much talent on the roster, and it's a great problem to have across the board. Uh, you know, if I had to say biggest concern of an injury, it's got to be Brady Cook because. Do we do we trust the other guys behind him to come in? You know, had Sam Horn not not got injured, may not be as concerned about it. But you know, you bring in uh, Drew Pine, and he's he's won the second spot. But it, it's like Case said in the pre-show, over over who? Like who, who was his competition to be the number two quarterback with Sam Horn out right now? You know, uh, and so. It's just kind of – it's times we're not used to as Mizzou fans, but I, I hope it's a reoccurring problem every year. You know, it's – this is things that Georgia fans have gotten used to under Kirby Smart's watch. You know, the, the Alabama fans got used to under Nick Saban, like five stars riding the bench, and they weren't stressing over it as fans. Uh, yeah. But we're, we're learning to adjust as we go, and it's exciting to – for the season to be coming so so rapidly quick. We are 24 days out as we record this, so by the time this gets out, it will be 23 days uh, from first opener against Murray State. 
on August 29th. So it's coming quick, guys. It, absolutely. It's it's here. We're knocking on the doorstep. Yeah. But uh, so to tag on what you said about all the talent in there, that is uh, – that's how you can tell this team is built for a long, long run here and we're not just kind of a flash in the pan. I think a lot of people thought we were a flash in the pan, especially, um, you know, after we go from 6-6, six 6-6 and six, six and six to 10 wins. Like, oh, you know, they jump up every now and then. But, no, you're right. You, and a lot of people don't. They don't want to crack the surface on the team because they're not Mizzou fans. But for us that we know, we know that wide receiver room is deep from Luther down to the bottom. You know, Luther's the star. We all agree with that. But all the way down to the last guy in that room, those are all studs. You know, the defense, like you said, we got a bunch of guys stacked up in there. I think I would say corner is the only lighter spot in there, you know. Um, you look and, at and the, I was going to say corner is just question marks for us right now. Just because, We don't know. Yeah, it, it's guys that we don't really know a lot about yet. Exactly, uh, yeah. They might um, even be better than what we had. It's, you, you, bring up a good, you bring up a good point with that, though, about the, the question marks because I feel like we kind of had that a little bit on the – defensive line last year but what what was the main thing that we brought back on the d-line that kind of made us feel a little bit more comfortable or at least what what key piece would be d-rob d-rob D-Rob, yeah. d-rob right so from a leadership aspect when you look at the secondary going into this season what's the returning piece in the secondary that kind of makes you feel a little bit more warm and fuzzy about it It'd be dale and carnell right Carnell, so, uh, Joseph Charleston, yeah, you know, there's right. There's a few guys exactly. returning back there. That exactly. So, yeah, there's some in, in Norwood, and you know, guys that guys that have experience, and then even to to call him a newcomer, just because that's plan on what he is, but pride. Um, but he has P P five experience, you know, playing under Clemson and and bringing those talents to our secondary. It you know, it makes you feel a little bit better. So. Absolutely. Was there anything else on on camp talk that we needed to y'all wanted to talk about? I'm I'm out on those folks. I have a question for you guys, but go ahead. Go ahead. Who do you think is faster? And this may be a good, uh, I guess, engagement post to put out. But uh, you know, we know so much about Speedy Johnson, right? But Kewan Lacey, that was brought in at you know, running back, freshman running back, is another speedster. So obviously we know what you know. Speedy Johnson has yet to be known. I guess what we what we see on the field with Lacey, but do we see Lacey kind of get introduced to a returner role like we saw Speedy Johnson this year, or or what? I mean, Drinkwitz, Drinkwitz talked about returner specifically. He was asked, uh, and on kick return, uh, you know, the reserve running backs, Tavoris Jones, Jamal Roberts. Uh, receivers he talked about, and then on punt, it sounded like it's pretty much wide receivers Luther, Theo, uh, Daniel Blood, them guys back there catching the punts in practice right now. Uh, the thing on returner, he said, was there's so much talent, there's guys that they have to get touches, and that's one thing he's talked about with Eric Link and Kirby Moore is you know. Hey, we might have to get Luther in here to return, just get him a couple extra touches this game, you know. And it's not to keep them happy; it's they are so freaking good with the ball in their hand. You know, they need as many touches as possible. He, so he, he kind yeah, of you don't want to waste that. reps. I don't. I don't look for Kiwan Lacey to burn his red shirt this year. Uh, so that that's four games, just you know, running back. It's not too often you hear of a true freshman coming in and just setting the world on fire. Uh, there's there's a lot more complex things that they have to learn in the offense when you go from high school to collegiate. So uh, it, it would be cool to see somebody like that returning the, the kicks and punts, but uh, I think Drink's more worried about getting – the upperclassmen touches throughout the game and going to utilize special teams for that. Is Luther done doing that uh, shortstop thing where he feels the ball on a roll and then picks it up and tries to run with it? I don't know. I hope so. Uh, I love Luther to death. One of my favorite Tigers uh, of all time probably, but boy, do I hate when he does that. 
Yeah, yeah, cut that shit out. I'm that sorry. Is, that is not pardon, SEC stuff. Pardon, pardon French. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot. Right. You cannot do that. That would that'll get us in trouble. And yeah, it just makes me wonder though with with the addition of Lacey and and returning Speed Johnson, it makes you wonder: do we do we see some of that introduced? Do we see maybe a mentor and aide kind of role um, with those two players? Are we done clamoring for Luther Burton to return? Um, punts. I guess we'll find out. First couple weeks of the season. You feel like? Do you feel like they'll use Luther in a role where, like, say it's like a tie tie game with whoever, you know, third fourth quarter, and they're punting in a big spot. You know, a lot of room to make a run, and they put Luther in there. I mean, I could see them doing it for sure. I guess um, I, just, I not think only, that... not only from an at you know athletic and and talent. Um, position but the the guy's going to draw attention so do you start to do you start to craft up misdirections from him because you know he's going to draw so much attention you know what about a punt return where you only rush nine and have speedy johnson on one hash on one side of the field and you have luther on the other side and they're both acting like they're going to catch the ball <laughs> then you're making that that coverage team scratch their head on who's really getting it. Well, yeah, especially when they do the the whole fake, like they're both going to catch it kind of deal, and yeah, you're going to have the have the kicking team turn around and look in the air trying to trying to find the ball like you're in a duck blind or something like that. Yeah, I just, uh, I just fear Luther catching a piss missile of a backup linebacker because he thinks he has the ball on <laughs> <laughs> injuring it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, we don't want that. I'm, I'm going to hit you with a hypothetical question, but first, let's talk about another sponsor of the show. Our guest segment and official apparel sponsor is 573Ts.com. Go check out all of their designs at 573Ts.com or swing by their new store at 8 Hit Street in downtown Columbia. 573Ts is local, and you can see their passion in their designs. So, for all your apparel needs, remember 573Ts.com. Appreciate it, Mr. Mickey. Uh, so my hypothetical, well, not really hypothetical, but opinion-based question. It has nothing to do with facts. Your top three favorite SEC schools to play. Good question. So start start with three. Top three favorite to play. Start with your third. Um, I'm gonna say number three. I'm gonna go with uh, Arkansas, and it was kind of a hog slaughter. Um, I got good the the game year before that. We we beat them to get our sixth win to go to the uh, uh, what bowl game we go to like the some game in Tampa against Wake Forest. Um, but man, that was so big that we did a, a show from the the parking lot. You called me up and we did a quick pod from there. And man, that was a fun environment because the Hog fans did not seem to care for us there that day. I remember that they were getting mad before the game. I remember before, and during the game, they were throwing fits. There was this one in front of me who, with his, his wife there, who was surrounded by Tiger fans, and KJ threw a pick to, to Carly, and he took his Hog hat off and he threw it in the ground. And he goes, Come on, babe, and grabbed her hand, and they marched on out of Faroe Field. And it was just too much fun. So I, I really enjoyed that game. And, um, I feel like it's always. I mean, I think it's been a fun series when we're not just smoking them. Like, so I'll go through. I'll go through the Arkansas. Only three reasons they don't ever compete with us that much. Also, I must say this can include Texas and OU in it, even though we don't have an SEC history with them. You know, we're what twelve years out from from playing them last. My Cole, you want me to go and go with my third? My third, I would say South Carolina. Uh, I know record shows that were were up on them. What Drinkwitz has never lost to him, even at App State, he has an SEC win against South Carolina. But them games last year wasn't particularly close. But there's been a lot of a lot of fun games. I mean, you know, you think a doink, you know, and what was that, thirteen or fourteen? Uh, but there's been a lot of battles. I respect their fan base. For the most part, I don't see a whole lot of, of trashy SEC or USC fans on 
on Twitter. So uh, give me the Gamecocks at, at the Prairie for favorite. I, I would have to agree with that, Skeeter. Uh, but from a different point, I mean, yeah, Drinkwood's record against South Carolina is great. Excellent, uh, one would say. Perfect. But, yeah, perfect. Um, but the the thing I look at in these games is it seems like no matter – I mean, even I guess kind of going back to 2014, it seems like every time we play them, especially as of late, but even kind of going back to the Barry Odom eras, that is a that is a game where you see the defensive line shine and the quarterback is just – run around with his like a chicken with his head cut off. So from a, a defensive perspective um, and the, you know, sacks and pressures and stuff like that, I'd say that's in South Carolina at three. All right. Give us your number two. Well, South Carolina's number two. I like playing them more. The games are more fun. We've had weird games at doing. Remember that monsoon where we should have won yeah. in 2018? It was terrible. Yeah. Terrible rain. Like, yeah. Yeah. Golly. Um, I've had fun. I remember the blow, I was the blowout where uh, my favorite, one of my favorite Tigers of all time, Carney Moboy, Kale Garrett, uh, they batted the pass backwards behind him, and he goes in the end zone, picks it up by himself, and he's like, touchdown. And everyone's going to look at him. He's like, no, that's a touchdown. I remember they, they reviewed it. They're like, oh, yeah, that, that's a touchdown. And I, that's a fun memory. Um, Drew Locke chugging the water. Yeah. The students that's what we're say. The water. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Martez Manuel doing, you know, the sandstorm with the towel that he found on the field uh, yep. two or three years ago. Their fans did not like that. They called him trashy, but I thought it was awesome. I think it was great. Um, what about, I think it was the COVID season where uh, they came back and started to challenge us because we had like a 14 0 lead. They get it seven, they start it again, and Martez Manuel just picks off right in the middle of the field. They put the, that's the first time they ever put on the robe, the boxing robe yeah, they do yeah. now. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, it's we're on a good run, and maybe we're being too much of a homework because we're just picking teams that we kind of beat a lot, you know. But I really do feel like we have a good history of South Carolina. I always look forward to the South Carolina Mizzou game. All right, number two for me is Florida. Uh, that's I, I believe it's what 50 50 between a split on uh-huh. games, but uh, man, there's there's been a lot of a lot of fun games, a lot of a lot of good energy there uh, between the fan bases. I feel like when we do play, you know, you have the brawl. Uh, what was it, twenty one? Uh, Halloween, yeah, that was a good one. time. One loss. Uh, yeah, and then you know, drink what's may the force be with you. And the next way, next day, Dan Mullen gets fired. You know, so uh, <laughs> you know it. There's been half of them really good games for us. Half of them were games we'd like to forget. Last year was almost one we like to forget, but turned out really good at the end. So uh, Florida's a fun competitive game to me that really I feel like is a toss-up every time we go into play them. That's as much as I like the easy wins, that's why Arkansas is not making my top three. I'm going to go maybe a little more untraditional, especially from if you're on Twitter, the sickos perspective. Uh, my number two would be Kentucky. And the reason behind that is because good, bad, or otherwise, you never know what you're going to get in that ball game. You may get your heart absolutely ripped out and have traumatic um, flashbacks and experiences dating back to those games for multiple years following them. But there's some good games. They result in rule changes for the SEC, um, <laughs> things of things of that nature. So, yeah, I'd say number two would be Kentucky. I guess right. from a Mizzou perspective, we usually don't play super, super good. Mm. But, I mean, even going back to the Drew Locke, um, Drew Locke years, that would have been, I want to say 2017 when this happened, when they're driving and you see the – Kentucky player knocked the ball out of the Mizzou player's hands, and then the ref kind of just moseys up to go pick it up, and I mean, it burns like 15 seconds off the clock. Um, it was an ugly loss. Call me sicko, but uh, Kentucky would be number two for me. If, if we could have – I would, because I agree, it's always an interesting game. 
if we could have pulled out like 2018 and not had just that absolute groin shot, which what words are we talking here? That was uh, my wife's first game as a Mizzou fan. Uh, she actually yeah. oh, the OPI game. Yeah, and she yeah, said the funniest game. thing. So we're sitting there, and Kentucky starts right in front of us. Uh, we're at the other end zone, and I'm nervous. And she looks at me, and she goes, "They have no timeouts. Like we're not, we're not losing this game. Like why are you freaking out so much?" And oh, I was like, "Don't Famous say that." Words. I was like, "Do not <laughs> say that." I was like, "You don't know Mizzou sports yet." Sure enough, and it was like. I, I let it rest because I was pretty upset walking out of there, just like quiet and just like, you know, fuming. Um, but I was like, remember when you said that we're not losing? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's Mizzou, baby. We do that sometimes. Like, we'll pull one of those out. So maybe we didn't have so many groin shots. I agree. Because you're right. It always is a fun game, you know? Even this past year was fun. How we let them get a – what, we spot them a 10, 14, 10 point lead? 14. We spot 14, them yeah. 14, and then we're like, all right, boys. That was ball. Let's go beat their ass. <laughs> like it's out of like 28 in a row on them, I think, or something yeah. like that. All right, Case, give us your number one. I'm going unconventional. Um, but my number one is uh Louisiana State University. And we don't play them a lot, but I think we're two and three since we joined the SEC against them. Nope, we're one and one and three. One and three, but two out of the three games have been very exciting games. Uh, one being Drinkwood's first win as a Mizzou Tiger with that SWAT in the end zone during COVID. Uh, I think I think that because – I think of that one because of all the juice and energy that gave Drink in his program. Um, and then I go to uh, last year's game where it, it – K-State was big, but it felt big because we disliked them from years gone by. The LSU game felt big because we all believed in our team. And um, I remember being a really good atmosphere. I know Skeeter hates them, but I thought their fans were pretty pretty cool, pretty chillax. They didn't have any problems with them. Um, like I've had with Orange and other red fan bases. So I I enjoy to play LSU, and I like it because I like I like that feeling because I feel like they're a big dog, and I like I think we competed with them fairly well. Okay, I believe we're one and th- one and two against them, not one and three. Uh, Drew Lock, Drew Lock got killed by him, uh, in sixteen, seventeen, somewhere in there. I and guess what then, I think one out of three is what I think what I meant to say. I, I think I misspoke. Okay. Uh, so n- number one for me, it's got to be OU. Them coming back to the conference, it just feels right playing them. Like, uh, the dislike for them is real. Uh. Don't believe in their coach. Not very fond of their fans talking like they talk. Uh-huh. I saw a guy at Walmart the other day had Oklahoma shirt on. And I said, y'all ready for SEC play? Oh, yeah, we got this. We got this. Like, they are coming in with their chest out, head held high. Uh, you know, kind of reminds me of the grown man football uh, comment. And then we we played Georgia game one. We learned what grown man football was. So. <laughs> I I see a rude awakening for them, but man, just the the hype around that game from our fan base. There's another energy level to that game alone that we don't have with any other SEC game. Uh, you know, as as far as selling out as fast as sold out and everybody talking about it. You know, it's it's probably there's more national media talking about that game for the Mizzou season than us going to Tuscaloosa. Yeah. which uh, is Yeah. Crazy. And so just the energy it's, it's brought back uh, getting to play the Sooners again. I, I think they're going to be my, my number one to play. Yeah. I guess that leaves I, me, huh? I just only didn't say them because it's been a long time since we played them. So since I hadn't seen it yet, I'm a show me boy. A show me. I hadn't seen it yet. Uh, my number one is the Razorbacks, man. Playing the Hawks. Um, it's Ooh, I been, to leave them out. I like that. That's fun. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It's been fun. I mean, yeah, obviously we've had our success, and I'm legitimately, I'm not trying to gloat and be like, oh, yeah, we whoop them every year kind of deal. Statistically, um, we have. We have. But call it a forced rivalry. Call it what you want. It, it really has kind of blossomed into something beautiful. I'll call it that. 
Um, it's not, uh, especially kind of, you know, after visiting Skeeter in Northwest Arkansas, and I've spent more time in Arkansas this year than I ever have before. I think I've spent uh, like three and a half weeks in Arkansas, maybe even close to four. But anyway, uh, it's it's turned into a good uh, a good rivalry, even though there's a lot of hog fans that don't want to call it a rivalry. Yeah, and can I sidebar on that real quick? Uh, only because we're talking about football, and I think football is a little different. But I would say overall, they are our, our number one rival. And I think in basketball, I would if you ask me the question, if you skier asked the same question in a couple months for basketball, I'm saying Arkansas is number one. There's a ton of juice when that game rolls around. Um, I know we're not very good at baseball, but I would say they're number one rival for baseball. I'm sure they have like LSU's tighter, but when they come here, they fill out Taylor and Red. Um, I've been to last two games here, and they're not they're not s- super polite about it. You know, they're uh, very you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, bragging. Give me give me an synonym for bragging. Um, but yeah, so they're pompous. I pompous. guess That's pompous about one. it. They're very pompous. You know, they're uh, they think they're very much better than us. So I th- I would say overall you're absolutely right, and I I wanted to put Arkansas one if. I feel like there's got to be some like tension for me. And there was in 2022, right? 2022, like that game, that was a great rivalry game in 2022 at home versus them, you know, back and forth, you know, late winter for us. But um, there's just been a lot of, a lot of butt kickings. The reason I left Arkansas out is because God forbid we do lose to them in football. And they will run their mouths so hard. I stress that game week and like hate where I live. Like, yeah, this can be so bad living here if we lose this game. It's going to be <laughs> awful, you know. And so it's not, it's not pleasurable for me until kickoff and then we start roasting the hogs. Uh, but, you know, 21, I didn't really know. A lot of people here are still relatively new, so that loss wasn't that hard uh, on me. But uh, I feel if, if we lose to them now, man, that the keyboard warriors are going to be out. I won't be able to listen to local radio. Like, yeah, I get that. won't be able to go to Walmart wearing any of my Mizzou stuff. Like, no, no, no. So one... That's why I left Arkansas out. Just. Me personally, where I live, I, I can't – I don't enjoy that game until we're winning. Maybe that – I get it. That's how I felt for K-State last year. Uh, it was not fun. I was talking to my buddy uh, who's a Mizzou fan, but his whole uh, dad's side of the family is all K-State grads and alumni. And I played in his family's golf tournament, uh, they have a charity golf tournament they do every year. Um, and it was the day we played the Georgia at home. It was beat and we didn't. I had on Mizzou polo, Mizzou ball cap, and uh, they just laid into me. They just they roasted me the entire time. Now I don't. They did it. They played it like the day of uh, the LSU game, so I didn't go last year. Uh, but I, I wanted to. I was bummed that I couldn't go solely because I just wanted to put it back in their face. I just wanted to flip it right back on them. But I get it, man. That game. It's not fun when all local media is on it. You know what I mean? When one of the when the Kansas City three play each other, and one that loses it gets absolutely roasted. So it is it sucks when you are on that side of it. Now for me, if we lost Arkansas. Yeah, Twitter would blow up, but not a soul in my real life would say anything. <laughs> you guys make me very happy to live where I live in Columbia, and I don't have to worry about opposing fan bases because most everyone that lives here is a Tiger. And uh, yeah, following a, a tough loss, you may see. Maybe a little bit less black and gold out and about, but uh, yeah, there's no there's no chirping if I decide to go to Hy-Vee or Aldi or work. Like <laughs> no one's gonna no one's gonna chirp me about it. So yeah, um, fellas just moved to Columbia and all your problems will be solved. We can get us an actual studio. Well, we an actual studio. We can live a stress free <laughs> life. Come game weeks, huh? Come on, man. Come up here. We'll yeah. start doing live from. Uh... We'll do them live from Addison's every, every well, Monday this, night. This is going to be the end of Mizzou sports. We're getting ready to go to an outdoor segment. I know we're going to lose probably a lot of people if they are still listening at this point, but uh, stick around. We're going to come back with an outdoor segment.
Our official outdoor segment sponsor is Rack Daddy Minerals. Operated right here in Columbia, Missouri, they have what the deer crave. From their variety of scents to their proven minerals, Rack Daddy Minerals has what you need to help your harvest potential. Go to their website at rackdaddyminerals.com and enter in code MIZ-10 to get 10% off your small mineral bag orders. When it comes to your deer herd needs, remember Rack Daddy Minerals. Give them what they want. All right, fellas, it is August, so we are a few weeks away from the start of dove season. And then once dove season hits, you blink and bows are out. I am actually one month away, I think tomorrow, from a velvet weekend that the state of Arkansas is starting this year. Uh, just a two-day hunt for archers to go out and, and try to get a buck in velvet. Uh, and so I feel we need to get kind of back in our groove and talking on, on outdoors. And, uh, you know, we get the support from Rack Daddy Minerals and kind of wanted to talk a little bit about deer hunting. The only thing I really have, I was reading an article on a new Bowtech bow today, and it is supposed to have the least amount of shock ever. Uh, the, the riser is cut out of aluminum. And they say it's it's so light, and there's virtually no vibration in your hand when you shoot. It's just like dead in your hands. And they rant and raved about it. Then I get down at the bottom of the article. You have an idea what this new bow costs from Bowtech? Thirty-five nine nine. How much? Oh, I thirty-five nine nine. What? Thirty-five hundred. Are you saying thirty-six hundred dollars? No way, dude. No, I'm saying uh, uh, between sixteen and eighteen hundred. Four thousand. I was going low. Four thousand dollars. Is this a cross? Hold on, is this a crossbow or a compound? No, compound I know a lot about bow. Motor. They're only producing like two hundred of them this year. Probably because there's only two hundred bow hunters in America. That can oh, it's an aluminum. It's an aluminum limbed bow. <laughs> I don't care if it was made out of unicorn farts. I'm not paying four thousand dollars for a bow. That's insane. I think Botex SS was six hundred dollars last year, and that's, that's like their insane. That's not their, is, there, is the SS still their flagship? I don't. It, I don't know. Two other bows in there. Just that price. I was like, whoa! With this, what inflation is going to? You know, we're we're going back to slingshots and spears. Bro, that I'm is sure this wild. We'll make some of our listeners upset because I know a lot of guys are into this. One of my best buddies is this is this guy. But dude, buy, if you're gonna buy a new bow, buy it the next year. Like, how much tech are you really losing on last year's bow? Yeah, because like the price drops. I I'm not gonna buy it because I don't know my bear is fine. But like, a, I wanted a bow tech SS. There's naturally a longer bow, so they get a longer draw without being a long draw bow. Because I've used a long draw bow, and you lose a lot of performance when you do that. Um, so I did want an SS, and I was that was that was last year's big bow. I was at Rogers a month ago. They've already come down from sixteen hundred to a thousand bucks. Now, still a thousand bucks drop on a bow is more than I really want to do right now. But so what I'm saying is that's that's a pretty significant drop off, and like how, the tech is still like super new. Yeah, the best thing to do is buy. So at the end of the season, when uh, all the archery shows, the ATA, and all these shows are going on in like January, just before turkey season starts, when Hoyt and Matthews and all these people announce their new bows for the upcoming fall, that's when you go and buy the stuff that was just brand new three months ago, and it's yep. significantly reduced in price. Yep. That's yep. Hot tip. Well, I was at, I was at a shields on the 4th of july this past fourth and they had all the stuff marked down a ton then because they're trying to get it out because they wanted to bring what you just said in for fall because now everyone's bringing new stuff in yeah i don't know or you could be like cole just barrels give you a bow hey i won that okay <laughs> it was a contest and i won it <laughs> i would fun. still be shooting my browning bow Yes, browning like the people that make shotguns and binoculars. That is a nice deer rifle brand, yeah. I, I really like that bow. And I'll tell you what, if this bear didn't cooperate, 
I might kill the turkey with it this year, but if it doesn't cooperate for a while, I'm going to go back to the browning <laughs> and I'll sell it. So, what is it? Is it hard for you all to even think about deer hunting right now when you go outside and it's 100 degrees out and, you know, you don't see the animals like, like usual, but then think you're a month out, <laughs> you know, from it officially being hunting season. Uh, it doesn't seem real right now. Yeah. It's also hard for me because, like, I feel like I've been fishing a lot this year. I've been done like really focused on that. And um, I think it was last week. Lindsay goes, "What are you going to talk about? What are you can talk about uh, on the outdoor section." And I was like, "I think they're going to talk about deer hunting." But I was like, "We just got back from two trout fishing trips, and like that's really it's all on my outdoor mind right now." Is like I'm I'm still on that mind. So yeah, it's hard. I think it's it's hard to even switch gears right now. You know, it's still hot outside. They're still biting. Yeah, dude, it was 95 degrees today. I'll I'll tell you right now. I mean, I may have a, uh, for those watching on YouTube, I may have a deer skull on the hat that I always wear. I love deer hunting. But uh, when it's 90 plus degrees outside, that is, field dressing a deer right now would not be at the top of my priority list. Just, you don't just even want plain. to go out and shoot your bow. <laughs> like, no, no. It's ridiculous. An it, indoor, it to to an indoor archery range. range. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. But no, um, I mean, you're exactly right, Case, that this summer has been, you know, my, my girls are growing up and we took a float trip uh, kind of over the fourth weekend and hit the smallies and, you know, small river fish uh, on the Merrimack. We've only been frog gigging one time, which is, I, dude, usually I have a good amount of frog legs socked away in with how wet the spring was in early summer. All the pond levels are up and so it's making frog gigging really difficult but we have been hitting the missouri river and been getting after uh after catfish matter of fact i texted you guys Whoa. last night saying that i wasn't gonna be able to to do a sunday show because we're still a sunday supper eating fresh blue cat off the of missouri so um yeah we've been we've been getting after it on the uh on the missouri river fishing big big muddy fishing um but don't get me wrong i, I still am very excited for deer season i'm just forcing myself to take it slow because I, I made the mistake of uh, two years ago getting after it too early and, and burning myself and burning my my wife out on it uh, come yep. <laughs> before the rut even got there. And so I'm forcing myself to take it slow. No, um, Cole, you nailed it, buddy. I am doing the same thing this year. I last two years, I pushed bows so, because I haven't, I haven't gotten a bow deer yet. And I was pushing it so hard, so hot and heavy. Like, you remember last year, I was shooting 3D tournaments every weekend. And, um, man, it's just, you know, you get that question, like, man, are you ever going to be home, you know, kind of thing. So I am going to ease into it. I want to wait for those first cool, cold weekends to pop up, you know, those cold fronts come through and just kind of play it like that. Cause that's, that's the real fun, you know, like oh, you for sure. big fronts come in for sure. And, I mean, don't uh, get me wrong. I'm if you're young though and don't have a family, I do hunt every weekend. Absolutely, go out there and let it rip. I'm not saying Absolutely. like you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying, as me and my point in life as a dad to you know younger kid and a husband, I gotta I gotta look out for them. I gotta be cool. But no, if you're like in your mid twenties, you know you're just hanging out, dude. Get out there every weekend. Like let it, you know, any chance you can get. Up, man. That's right. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, dude. I'm. Uh, it's funny, Peyton. My wife asked me the other day. She said. I have a proposition for you. She said, would you trade a one week elk hunt for not hunting whitetail like all all year long? She's like, Would you would you be willing to make that trade if I propose that to you? I was like, No way, dude. No way. I was like one week of of hunting elk as opposed to four months of hunting whitetail? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not taking that trade. But uh, don't get me wrong, man. I'm and call me crazy. I guess if you want, if you want to call me out on social media, that's fine. But I am very, very excited to get some freezer queens back, uh, back filled up in our in our freezer. I don't, I don't know. You know, obviously, I've never hunted northern or central Missouri, so I don't know how it is for y'all. Uh, for me, I feel my best opportunity to get a buck. Is early season 
uh, get out in the woods before a lot of other people get out there and start putting pressure on them. Muzzleloader weekend hits, and it's like deer movement cuts in half for me right then and there. Uh, a lot of gun hunters around here, and they shoot at movement and sound before they even identify what it is. So the, the deer really bed down. But uh, So I get excited about early season. I, I feel like once muzzleloader, my hunting season's over with. And I know you still got rut to come and all that, but like I'm telling y'all, it's it just from the deer movement I see at the very beginning of season when they're not used to us being out there and putting pressure on them uh, to middle of the season, it is it's so drastically different uh, in in what I see, and you know you go two or three hunts in a row on public land without seeing a deer, it's kind of hard to stay motivated for a while. Uh, and so early season, I don't I don't know that I go two hunts in a month without seeing a deer. Uh, it's it's just so, so different. So I get I really amped go, up to the beginning of it and then tail off. I can go all September and not see a deer. <laughs> like I don't see a ton of early season deer. And if I do, it's it's nothing like legal to shoot. So I think I see everything that is a shooter around like around October, but mid October is when it really starts heating up. That's when the weather makes you want to go out there. That's when your cold fronts are rolling in and exactly everything else. But just tell you, it's it, it's I almost feel- not worth it at times for me. They don't, they, and they know what it is, what it is, but they just, they don't seem to want to move around a whole lot when it's those hot 80 degree days, you know? All right, fellas, anything else y'all want to talk about? I think I pretty much covers it for what, middle of August, first week yeah. of August. Yeah. I'm trying to get some it. guests, some guests lined up, uh, you know, some people in the media and whatnot. And so hopefully I can get that going. Uh, if not schedules don't align and all that, then you'll, you'll just have to suffer through us still, but we're, <laughs> we're into uh, season three of the woods, water, Mizzou podcast. And we appreciate the, the growth and our listeners and the support that we've gotten. Uh, our, our sponsors, MKS five, seven, three T's rack daddy minerals. Uh, if you're wanting to sponsor the podcast, reach out to us. We're all on Twitter. Uh, we're on YouTube, obviously. Uh, Cole, you run the Instagram account for the Twitter. It's all at Mizzou Pod. Case runs the Facebook account for us, Woods Water Mizzou. So if you're want, if you're interested in uh, helping us and doing what we do, maybe get a little bit better quality audio or, or video for us, just let us know. But that is going to do it for this week's episode. Everybody have a great week for Case Cole Skeeter. M-I-Z. Z-O-U. Go Tigers. They'll take care. Z-O-U.